You mean the one that you, uh, the one that you, um, that you, you know, somebody's house, you, you set up an appointment with him, oh. phone number? Yeah, right. Uh, Tom Smith. Tom Smith. I can send it to you. Thank you, Jerry. Okay. All right. You're all here not to hear hear us tonight. We're here to here to uh, hear a great program on Calvert Cliffs. So uh, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Stephen Gottfried. He was born and raised in the province of Quebec, Canada. He has always been fascinated with nature and natural history museums. As an early teen, he began to collect fossil seashells, pine cones, and skeletons for his own bedroom natural history museum. That word skeletons kind of scared me though when I, when I first read that. He received a BSc in biology from Bishop's University and a PhD in paleontology from McGill University. I found a two-year postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Toronto. He moved to Drumheller, Alberta, which is known as the dinosaur capital of Canada where he became involved in the paleo's uh, exhibit work from museums around the world. In 1998, Dr. Godfrey became the curator of paleontology at the Calvert Marine Museum in Solomons, Maryland, where his mandate is to collect, preserve, and interpret fossils from the famous Calvert Cliffs along the Chesapeake Bay. Most of the fossils that he quarries from the cliffs are the extinct whales and dolphins that lived between eight and 18 million years ago. So we want to welcome Dr. Godfrey and uh, if you've never been to the uh, Solomon, uh, uh, to the Calvert Mar Marine Museum, it's worth a trip uh, when you're down there collecting that Calvert Cliffs. So Dr. Godfrey, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Jerry, for the invitation. It's my pleasure to join you guys this evening. So I'm going to share my screen. I just have to make sure I get the right screen. Yep, I see it. There, are you good? We're good. Okay. So this evening I would like to present to you um, a talk on the geology and Miocene paleontology of Calvert Cliffs. And uh, as most of you probably already know, Calvert Cliffs extend for about 35 miles along the western shore of the Chesapeake Bay from southern Anne Arundel County down to the southernmost tip of Calvert County between those two yellow arrows on the screen. So the age of the sediments that comprise the cliffs range from about um, 18 million years uh, ago old to about 8 million years uh, ago. So there's roughly 10 million years worth of Earth's geologic history preserved in the sediments along the cliffs. And so you can see that they're within the Miocene epoch. So when you compare how recent the Miocene is to the overall age of the Earth, it really is in what we refer to sometimes as the nosebleed section of the geologic column. It's quite recent, relatively speaking. So here's a photograph of a typical section of the cliffs. And uh, you can see that um, the base of the cliff is uh, easily eroded by the wind and the waves, the wind pushing the waves and the high tides that pound against the base of the cliff. Now the sediments are not consolidated. They're not cemented together. You can walk up to the cliffs and you can start excavating with your fingernails. They're just that soft. So they, they consist of clays and sands mixed in various proportions. And you'll see on the left-hand side of this photograph that uh, some of the cliff has slumped away. So the cliff can fail catastrophically. And so we always have to be mindful when we're walking along the cliffs or when, especially when we're quarrying fossils along the cliffs. You'll notice that the sediments appear to be horizontal. They actually dip just slightly to the southeast, about 11 feet down for every mile that you travel along the cliffs. 
which is great because the sediments then eventually come down to you at all the, all the beds come down to beach level at some point along the cliffs. So this is the geologist uh, interpretation of the different layers that are preserved along the cliffs. And the only thing I want to draw your attention to is you'll notice that uh, in this illustration, there are some beds that look like little bricks, little brickwork. And uh, those beds, uh, the brick uh, formation there actually uh, is used to designate layers that are highly fossiliferous. So along the cliffs, there are some beds that are just chock full of uh, carbonate fossils, of the shells of mollusks that lived during the Miocene. And those really shelly beds then alternate with beds that are more clay, that are almost devoid of fossils. And then the shelly beds come back and then the clay beds and the shelly beds. And so there's this repeating pattern that we see along Calvert Cliffs. And that has everything to do with the prehistoric environment that existed during that 10 million year period of time when the sediments that make up the cliffs were being laid down. So here's the geologist um, rendering of what uh, we think the Miocene North America looked like. And you'll notice that there's no uh, polar ice cap. Overall, global climates were warmer then on average than they are now. So there was no ice at the North Pole and there was less ice at the South Pole. So when you melt those polar ice caps, you in invariably raise the level of the water in the oceans. And you'll notice that the, uh, the arrow is pointing at the Atlantic coastal plain. And this area, uh, certainly where I am, not where you are, but certainly where I am, would have been underwater for most of that 10 million year period of time. So here's uh, a view of uh, the Chesapeake Bay, the Delmarva Peninsula in the foreground, and then the arrows are pointing out where Calvert Cliffs are. The green dot is where I am at the Marine Museum. And then we're looking west towards Washington, the Piedmont, and the Appalachian Mountains. So during the Miocene, Stephen, I accidentally muted you when I went to mute the person coming in. Okay, so from this illustration, you can see that at times during the Miocene, uh, the Atlantic Ocean covered over much of the Atlantic coastal plain up to what's known as the fall line, where the rivers that were flowing then uh, are flowing now and were carrying sediment that was being eroded from the Piedmont and Appalachian Mountains. And that those sediments were being deposited in this vast inland extent of the Atlantic Ocean and the sediments that were being eroded from the mountains are now deposited, now comprise Calvert Cliffs. So if you could uh, turn the clock backwards and push all that sediment back up on top of the mountains, the Appalachian Mountains would be much higher uh, prior to all this erosion that took place during the Miocene. Now, during that 10 million year period of time when Calvert Cliffs were being laid down on the bottom of the ocean, global climates fluctuated. The temperature was not constant. And so there were some times when the climate actually cooled a little bit. And when the climate cooled, more ice was put uh, on, in the South Pole. And so the water would have been pulled out of the oceans. And so you can see then from where I am here at the museum, we would have been much closer to the coastline. And so if I just go back to the previous illustration here, you can see that we're a long ways from the shoreline. And so what that generally means is that the only sediments that make it out to where Calvert Cliffs are now would be fine grain sediments that would have stayed suspended in the ocean water long enough to drift out that far and then settle to the bottom. So when you have a very deep ocean like this, it's reflected in clay sediments, uh, almost devoid of sand. But when the, the water is much more shallow, then you get uh, the sandy sediments in which you have all of these mollusk shells because conditions were ideal for the shelled animals to be living close to shore in a highly oxygenated environment. Now there were times when Calvert Cliffs would not have been covered at all by the ocean and they would have been forested. But then the climate warmed 
the ice was melted and the water would come back in. And so if you could, if you could view that 10 million year period of time, if you could time lapse it and watch the water, you would see it moving back and forth across the Atlantic coastal plain. And the depth of the water then just is reflected in the cliffs by the different kinds of sediments that are preserved and the different kinds of fossils. So now what I'm going to do is show you a series of photographs of the cliffs starting from the towards the north end of the cliffs. And here we're just south of the town of Chesapeake Beach, just south of Bayfront Park, which is a public access point along the cliffs. And uh, the, the reason or the purpose of this photograph, the, the occasion, was uh, brought on by the gentleman that's standing uh, the furthest to uh, the left down here at the base of the cliff. And he brought us out to show us the, the very front part of a fossil dolphin skull that had just become exposed and was beginning to erode from the cliffs. Well, we had permission from the property owner to excavate the skull, but we decided not to because you can see that just immediately next to us, giant sections of cliff had spalled off. And at the top of the cliff, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor here on the screen, um, there was a giant section of sediment that looked like it was about to come down. So we're always, as I mentioned earlier, mindful when we're out along the cliffs and we didn't think it would be a great idea to, to have pick and shovel and start pounding away at the base of the cliff to dig the hole necessary to remove the fossil dolphin skull from the cliffs. So that, that skull we just left to erode naturally and didn't try to excavate it. This is a photograph that was taken at about the midpoint in the north-south extent of the cliffs. And here you'll notice that the water is almost always up against the base of the cliff. And the cliff here, the sediments at the base of the cliff are very, very clay. So they're relatively resistant to erosion. This is about two miles south of the previous photograph. And here at a low tide, you can see all that white speckly material on the beach. That's actually one of those really shelly layers that is exposed when the tide is pulled out and, it's, and if it has pulled the sand off the beach. So this is a great place to go if you're interested in mollusks. And this is a, just a, a view of that layer. And you can see my watch in the center of the photograph just to give you a sense of the scale and the density of the shell material. These are all Miocene shells. So the vast majority of the shells that are preserved or that occur along Calvert Cliffs are actually fossil are Miocene shells. They're not modern shells. There are very few modern mollusks living in the, uh, in the brackish water of the Chesapeake Bay today. This is the southernmost extent of Calvert Cliffs in a community known as uh, the Chesapeake Ranch Estates. And this is a deceptively calm day. And the other extreme would be a view like this. This was a few years ago when Hurricane Hannah came up the bay. And I'm always impressed at the volume of sediment that a storm like this can move around. Uh, not so much fresh erosion of the cliffs, but just taking the slump piles, the talus slopes that have fallen down from the cliffs and, and working them and moving them and sorting them. It's a great time after a storm like this to go out to look for fossils. So now I'm gonna show you a few photographs of us quarrying along Calvert Cliffs. Uh, the climate is warm enough that we can go out uh, all year round, even in the winter. This photograph was taken during the winter, in fact. And uh, you can see our collections manager, John Nance, is up on a ladder and he's excavating a dolphin skull, a fossil Miocene dolphin skull, from a very productive layer that occurs in this point up high in the cliff. You'll notice that the beach is quite wide here. That's typical of what we would refer to as a blowout tide, when uh, typically it is, um, the sun and the moon are working uh, in favor to give us a low tide, but in addition to which, we have a high pressure system which is pushing the water out of the bay and the wind is blowing from the northwest. So all of those factors uh, co-conspire to push the water out and the beach is very wide. And so again, it's a great time during the winter, during blowout tides to go and look for fossils. Here is a photograph of that same section of the cliffs during more typical summer situation. So the beach is very narrow and in fact the tide was coming in and you can see the size of the hole that we dug into the base of the cliff. Uh, this excavation was in order to remove a fossil dolphin skull that was about four feet long, a small brain case with a very long snout 
on this kind of dolphin, and the stick that I'm wielding is uh, to laminate into the field jacket the cast that we built around wrapping bandages. You can see it in the base of the hole. There are some bandages there. They're gypsona bandages. They're basically a cheesecloth that's been soaked in plaster of Paris, and we just open up the bandage package. We soak the bandage for about 10 seconds in the water of the bay, and then we can unroll it around the fossil a whale or dolphin skull, and then we can carry that back to the museum. We want to immobilize the bones so that they don't break any further because often they're cracked and delicate to begin with. So the rest of the talk is just going to be showing you some of the diversity of fossils that have been found along Calvert Cliffs. There are over 600 different kinds of organisms that have been preserved as fossils in the cliffs. And so uh, the photograph here is actually our waterfront at the Marine Museum. That's the Drum Point Lighthouse that you're looking at. It used to be two miles out at Drum Point, which is where the Patuxent River flows into the Chesapeake Bay. And it's a traditional screw pile lighthouse that is uh, typical, was typical of the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, when it was decommissioned by the US Coast Guard, it was moved to our site and we've restored it. And it's one of the exhibit uh, components here at the Marine Museum. So if you do come to the museum, you should make sure that you tour the lighthouse. It's fascinating to see inside. People would actually live offshore. Uh, the light keeper uh, would live offshore with his family in this uh, two-story residence. And it's just amazing to see how they lived in that space. So there are untold trillions of microscopic fossils preserved along Calvert Cliffs. All you need is a teaspoonful of sediment to uh, find a diversity of fossils like this. And I'm showing you a photograph of a foraminiferin and a diatom. So two very different kinds of microscopic organisms that were uh, abundant during the Miocene. And each one of these is important in its own right. It has an evolutionary history. But what's especially nice about fossils like this is that they are used by geologists to uh, give us really good indication as to what the water temperature was, what the salinity was, and what the water depth was. Because these animals have preferences in terms of the environment in which they live. And so geologists use these to help to read the rocks, to reconstruct what the prehistoric environment was like when those microfossils were living. Calvert Cliffs boasts over 400 different kinds of mollusks. It's the largest group of, uh, of invertebrates that have been found along the cliffs. And you can see there's some beautiful mollusks. Uh, there are also echinoderms, so the spiny skinned animals, which include sand dollars and brittle stars and, and sea stars. There are also barnacles, so another group uh, of uh, filter feeding animals, and they live inside those little tests that they build. You can see it attached to the scallop shells. And they have a little arm that they wave. So they're, they're carnivores. They're animals, not plants. And they're also um, bryozoans. Bryozoans are the moss animals. They're filter feeders. They're colonial animals that build a little um, superstructure for the individuals to live in. And then there were some corals. Now, the corals that were here were not reef-forming corals. They were just um, these colonial corals that would grow anchored to a hard substrate on the bottom of uh, the bay of the Atlantic Ocean at that time. We boast the world's largest fossil crab. It's a spider crab. So you can see in the uh, figure here that this central portion here, which looks like a little square, is the central part of the body. And then the very long legs that come off this animal. So it was given a new name, and amplesimus just means large or uh, enormous. So Labinia is a living genus of spider crabs that presently inhabits the Chesapeake Bay, but they're much, much smaller than these very large spider crabs. And in the lower right-hand corner of this slide, you can see a close-up view of one of the crab claws. But notice how riddled with cracks uh, the surface of the actual shell material was. So it's a very, very delicate. And this uh, find was just remarkable that that much of the spider crab was found. Most of the collectors that uh, spend their time along the cliffs are hoping to find the teeth of Megalodon, the extinct giant shark. And uh, we know that these sharks were specialized in 
preying upon whales and dolphins. And that's because from time to time, we actually find bones that have been marked by megalodon teeth biting them. So they're shark bite traces or bite marks. And in, um, okay, so where will we start? So the upper right-hand corner of the illustration, you can see that there's a skeleton, outline drawing of a skeleton of a small baleen whale during the Miocene with uh, a skin diver for scale. And then the lower, just below it, is a restoration of what that whale might have looked like when it was alive. So next to that, on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see uh, the bone. I'm just gonna stop for a minute and jump down. At the bottom, the very bottom of this uh, slide, there's a long bone. That's actually part of uh, the lower jaw of a baleen whale. And if you look closely at it, you'll see that there are all kinds of bite marks on it or bite traces. And one of those is illustrated in the upper left-hand corner where you can see that the megalodon tooth struck the bone and then the little bumps, the little serrated edge, the steak knife-like edge of the megalodon tooth raked the surface, confirming that it was in fact a megalodon that was biting repeatedly this lower jaw of this baleen whale. So that to me suggests active predation, that when an animal is biting your head, he's trying to kill you. And of course, the tongue is a delicacy. There's a lot of meat there. And so as an example, modern killer whales will often kill a whale and just eat its tongue and lift, leave the rest of the carcass for other scavengers. The next uh, photograph that I'm gonna show you are actually, is actually a single vertebra from a fossil dolphin. This is a, a line drawing of the skeleton of one of the more common types of dolphins that lived during the Miocene. This is an animal called Ziphiocetus bossi. Ziphia means sword. So these are the sword dolphins, just in reference to the very long snout that they have. And you'll notice that three of the tail vertebrae just down in front of the fluke have been uh, blackened. So the next bone that I show you is one of those blackened bones. They're called peduncular vertebrae. It just refers to their position at the base of the tail. So this is actually a remarkable discovery. It's a single vertebra looking at it from uh, left and right sides and then a top view looking down the sides uh, of the vertebra. And you'll notice that there are a series of deep gouges on both sides of the vertebra. So the only way to get that on both sides would be if that vertebra was actually wedged between two adjacent megalodon teeth. So this is the restoration of the jaw of megalodon that's in our paleontology gallery. And I took the vertebra and I just slid it down onto these teeth into some of, the, some of the grooves, some of the cut marks that occur along the sides of the vertebra. So we know from uh, studying modern great white sharks, which you can see here in the center of the photograph, there's a great white shark that's actually scavenging a dead baleen whale. Looks like, a, um, it looks like, Oh, I've just gone blank. Um, <laughs> it's a big baleen whale. <laughs> it's not a blue whale, a fin whale, a say whale. It's a, oh. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, so modern great white sharks, oh, it's a humpback whale. I'm sorry, okay, it's a humpback whale. So modern great white sharks will scavenge carcasses of whales that are larger than themselves, but apparently they will not scavenge animals that are smaller than themselves. However, they will hunt down and kill uh, small, smaller animals than themselves, and they don't generally kill animals that are larger than themselves. So if the same reasoning uh, is applied to megalodon, because Megalodon was so large, they attained lengths of 20 meters, so that's like 65 feet long. There were no whales, there were no dolphins, there were no sea cows or sea turtles that would have been larger than Megalodon. So Megalodon could have hunted any one of those animals. And uh, all those bites that we see on the side of the vertebra, each one of those gouge marks represents a separate bite. And so it's like Megalodon 
swam up behind, chased down or swam up, uh, ambushed the dolphin from behind and bit the tail repeatedly, its teeth cutting into the base of the tail, almost like Megalodon was saying to that dolphin, you are never going to get away from me. Very aggressive kind of predatory behavior on the part of Megalodon. So I'm just gonna say one more thing about Megalodon. Uh, sometimes we think that uh, we're the first to take an interest in the fossil shark teeth that occur along Calvert Cliffs. And in fact, what's fascinating is that we find uh, fossil shark teeth in Indian archeological sites. So Amerindians, indigenous peoples to North America, were collecting and trading and moving fossil shark teeth around. They've even been found as far west as Ohio in burial mounds there. And here's an example of a megalodon tooth that was notched at the base of the tooth so it could be hafted onto a spearhead or a shaft. So the edge of the tooth was cut into on both sides so sinew could be used to hold it to a handle. And you'll notice that one side of the megalodon tooth was used so much that it actually wore the serrations that you can see on the opposite side right away. So it was used either as a, as a cutting implement or a scraping device for cleaning hides. So Amerindians were using these ready-made tools that were available to them here along Calvert Cliffs. There is a, a great diversity of other kinds of fossil sharks that have been found along the cliffs. There's over 50 different kinds of sharks and some of the ones that I'm showing you now are some of the more common ones that are found. Uh, from time to time, we also find whale and dolphin bones that have fossil shark teeth actually embedded in them. So the yellow arrow is pointing at the tip of a, a shark tooth uh, that became embedded in this bone. It's a humerus, it's an upper arm bone in the flipper of a whale. And so a scenario like this could be envisaged where the whale might have been dead already, it might have been scavenging, or it might have been harassing it, and it bit into its arm and, and shook its head violently, scraping and marking the bone, but the force of the bite was so powerful that the tip of the tooth broke off and became embedded in the bone itself. In the lower right-hand corner of this uh, slide, you can see that there is a part of uh, a shark vertebra, a shark backbone piece. And the blue arrow is pointing at two very small shark teeth that are embedded in that, in that partial vertebra. What's fascinating about this specimen is that the cartilage from the vertebra actually grew up around the teeth. And so whatever kind of encounter this was, it was obviously a shark biting another shark. The shark that was bitten and um, had the two teeth embedded in its vertebra, it actually survived this encounter. And so we think that this was maybe shark on, on shark predation or perhaps an accidental strike during a feeding frenzy. We even have a dolphin skull that has gouge marks uh, actually in the eye, eye socket itself. And so uh, this shark aggressively bit the skull of this poor hapless dolphin. And uh, we don't know if it was scavenging or predation, but we can see that uh, sharks were definitely interacting with the diversity of dolphins that were here along Calvert Cliffs. This is perhaps one of the most unusual fossils that I've ever seen, and uh, I, will see, I will not likely see another one like this in my professional career. Uh, what this person is holding is actually a coprolite. And for those of you who are fanciers of fossils, know that a coprolite is the technical term that we use to refer to fossilized feces. But what's remarkable about this specimen is you can see that there are some tooth impressions in, that were made in the coprolite before it fossilized, in the feces before it fossilized. And the coprolite was found, uh, the shark bitten coprolite was found here along Calvert Cliffs by the gentleman that you can see in this slide, Dougie Douglas. He's a, he's a, a well-known professional collector. He sells the fossils that he finds and we, we purchased uh, that very, very unusual fossil from him. And so because these are natural tooth impressions, you can see from the bottom of the photograph, there is actually a, a silicon rubber cast that I made. I mixed up this casting compound and I poured it over the copper light and the casting compound went into the tooth impressions. And when it had cured 24 hours later, I pulled it out. And so you can see the shape of the teeth 
that penetrated into the coprolite before it was fossilized. And they match most closely with the, the tiger shark fossils that occur here along Calvary Cliffs, the tiger shark teeth. So we think that it was a tiger shark that bit this coprolite or bit the feces before it came, became fossilized. So for me, there's an amazing story here, like how did this happen? So we think that the coprolite, the feces originally came from a crocodile. And uh, it may have defecated into the water and it might've been floating uh, and the shark came along and uh, bit it. But obviously, the tooth impressions indicate that the shark did not consume the coprolite. It just bit it, it uh, tested it. So we know from a study of modern tiger sharks that they will bite things to assess their palatability. Is this in fact something I want to eat? And they bite it, if it is, they eat it. If they don't, they don't, they don't consume it. And so here, uh, the shark bit the feces, left its tooth impressions, um, but did not consume it because obviously those tooth impressions would have not survived passage of the fecal material through the digestive system of the tiger shark. But what's interesting about it is if you flip it over, you can see in the center of the copper light here, there's just a few faint impressions, which to me suggests that the, the fecal material was not floating through the water or even sitting on the ocean floor when the shark sampled it, but rather it may have still been within the body of the crocodile and the tiger shark plowed into it in a very aggressive attack on the crocodile, on these marine crocodiles that lived here during the Miocene. And I'll show you some more photographs of these a little bit further into the program. Um, bit so forcefully that its teeth penetrated the abdominal wall, leaving an impression of, of the teeth in the, in the feces within the digestive system in the intestines of the crocodile. There's a great diversity of different kinds of uh, bony fish that have been found along Calvert Cliffs in addition to all the sharks. There's about 50 different kinds of fish that have been found. And uh, here are some examples, remarkable examples of <clears throat> fish that are found. So in the lower right-hand corner of the slide, you can see basically the full body of a tiny fish called a poacher. And you'll notice this, the front over here on the left-hand side of the skeleton is where the skull would be in the branchial, the gill region. And then you can see these spiky little scales that go all the way down to the very end of the tail, which is not preserved. So this is a beautiful example of a poacher fish that is found along Calvert Cliffs. Um, some years ago, a collector collected a complete scallop shell. Both valves of the scallop were together. He took it home to his place in New Jersey and when he opened up the scallop, he found this little fish skull of a sea bass that was found inside. So after the scallop died, this sea bass entered the scallop shell and the two valves then closed again, preserving the little fish almost like in a little sarcophagus. There's a diversity of fossil turtles that have been found along the cliffs. And there's also some land turtles that made their way into this marine environment. So there's an enormous turtle. You can see uh, this leatherback turtle in the upper portion, restoration of what it looked like. So they had um, quite a, a large carapace. The whole animal would have been between eight and nine feet long. And so the young lady in the lower left-hand corner here of the photograph is holding the humerus or the upper arm bone from one of these very large turtles. And then there's another turtle here uh, with our little human skeleton as, as a scale, a much more typical sized sea turtle. So this leatherback, leatherbacks live today and they're the largest living turtles, they're marine turtles. So here's another view of uh, some of the marine crocodiles that were here, an animal known as Theca champsa. And uh, from time to time we far find portions of the skull and you can see in the upper left-hand corner of the slide, there's tooth sockets there. So the teeth are found more commonly along the cliffs. And it's related to a crocodile that lives today in Southeast Asia. So that's another indication that the climate was warmer. There were crocodilians that were living here during the Miocene. And you'll notice that crocodiles, like living crocodiles, the body was armored. It had bony plates that ran from just behind the skull all the way down to the end of the tail. So they had a body armor. And uh, that's what you're looking at here on the right hand side of this uh, slide is one complete osteoderm or scoot. And it has a very typical or very, very characteristic type of sculpturing 
that all you need to do is find a small part of this and you know that you have a, a crocodile scoop. Here's a typical tooth that's found uh, from one of these large Miocene crocodiles. There is a diversity of birds that were found that are found along the cliffs and uh, most of them are marine birds, are pelagic birds. These are oceanic birds that spend much of their time out over the water like gannets and petrels and auks. And so in the lower left hand portion you can see uh, a a photograph of the most complete ox skull that has ever been found along Calvert Cliffs. And it's about, I would say about three inches long. So it's just a beautiful example of preservation along the cliffs. We uh, boast uh, some of the largest flying birds that ever lived here, Pelagornis, which just means large uh, flying bird, a supersaur. They would have spent much of their life on the wing like albatross do. And so they had an 18 foot wingspan, so nine foot wingspan on either side. And they had false teeth, they had little bony prongs that would have been very useful for them to catch uh, slippery bodied fish or squid as they skimmed the surface of the waves. We also find fossilized feathers along the cliffs and this is uh, exceedingly rare. This is the only place in the world where fossilized feathers have been found in coprolites, again, in fossilized feces. So this is an impression of the, of the fossilized feather. And so here's the actual specimen. It's, an Amer it's uh, one from the Smithsonian. And the circle here is actually highlighting that to feather impression. But when you look at this specimen under a microscope, you can see that feathers are swirled throughout the, uh, the fossilized feces. And so something like this would have happened where a bird or a pelagic bird was eaten by a crocodile. And even though they have very high acid contents in their digestive system, they weren't able to fully digest the feathers. And so they voided those, they passed them out in their feces. And so in their feces, these feathers are preserved. And uh, we took a small portion of one of these uh, uh, fossilized feathers and scanned it under electron microscope and you can see the remarkable detail that's preserved here. So what you're looking at is the vein of the feathers. These are adjacent barbs in the feather. So the vein of the feather consists of the central shaft and then you have the barbs that go off from that and they're held together by a Velcro-like structure which you can see here coming off of each barb. There are barbules and little hooks. So this is amazing preservation that we have in this coprolytic, this fossilized feces material, preserving these fossil feathers. So now I'm going to show you some of the diversity of the land animals that we find along the cliffs. So the sediments, as I've said, uh, were being laid down on the bottom of the ocean. So how do we get large land animals out into the ocean? And typically we attribute those fossils having been brought there through a process known as bloat and float. So we think that maybe during a storm event, a mastodon or some other large land animal like a rhinoceros uh, would have tried to ford across a river and maybe drowned. And so then the river would have carried the carcass out into the Miocene Ocean. And as it decomposed, as it was being scavenged, different parts of it would have fall, fallen to the ocean floor and uh, been uh, fossilized that way. So teeth are the hardest parts of our skeleton that we make. The enamel on our teeth is the very hardest part. And so they have the best chance of becoming fossilized. And so here are some examples of fossilized elephant. They're called mastodons, gomphotheres, that are found along the, along the cliffs. And so you can see that they're very similar in size to modern Indian elephants. And they had these huge robust cusps that they would have used for grinding up the plant material. Uh, we've even found teeth of juveniles and here on the left hand most side, the upper left hand corner, there's a photograph of a baby elephant tooth, just a milk tooth that was shed by, by the baby gomphothere. Rhinoceros teeth are found, but they're exceedingly, exceedingly rare. They're very diagnostic. All you need is a small part of a rhino tooth to know for sure that you have a rhinoceros. And in the, the lower right hand corner, you can see that uh, the young lady is holding this bone. That bone is actually the tibia. It's the lower leg bone of a rhinoceros where the blue arrow here in this illustration of one of these Miocene rhinos is standing next to a human, adult human for scale. And you can see they're like giant pot-bellied pigs. And so they were very stubby in terms of their legs, very short legs, but very large barrel shaped bodies. And so we find rhino bones along the cliffs as well. 
There were camels that were here. Their remains are about as rare as uh, can possibly get. Just a few camel remains have been found along the cliffs. Peccaries, these little pig-like animals that live today in the southwest United States and into Mexico, were the most common types of land animals that we find along the cliffs. And uh, you can see here from our scale, from a child to these this pig-like animals, they're in a separate family. They're like New World pigs, as, as opposed to the pigs that we're familiar with. They're, they're actually not indigenous to North America, whereas these pigs were in fact indigenous, native to North America. In terms of the large carnivores, we find dog-like animals. They would have been similar in size to a German Shepherd. And then these very large bear dogs, Miocene bear dogs, these amphicyonids, we find their teeth very rarely as well, but they would have had massive skulls. They would have been much like uh, giant hyenas, very powerful jaws for crushing bones. And so very um, obviously dangerous pred land predators during the Miocene. Now we're going to go back to some of the marine mammals that have been found along the cliffs. And there's uh, one type of, at least one type of seal, probably up to as many as three different kinds of seals. And uh, there's a beautiful skull that's preserved here of a skull of a, of a seal, Miocene seal. And you can see the scale here that they're about the same size as modern seals. There's quite a diversity of whales and dolphins that have been found. There's at least 35 different kinds of dolphins and about uh, six or seven different kinds of whales. And so the skull that's being shown here is actually from a sperm whale. They were small compared to modern sperm whales. That skull is only about two feet long. So little tiny sperm whales, uh, pretty much like pygmy sperm whales that live today. And then as I've mentioned previously, these very long snouted dolphins at the bottom, of, you can see a photograph looking down on the top of the skull and how small the brain case region is where the eyes and the brain would have been. And then the very long snout that these dolphins had. Here's another example of a long snouted dolphin, a different uh, genus. These animals are related to the Ganges River dolphin, to freshwater dolphins that are alive today. There were uh, quite a variety of uh, animals that uh, probably gave rise to modern delphinids, modern bottlenose dolphins. And so these animals are typically known as Kentriodontids. And in life, they would have looked very much like modern delphinids, modern bottlenose type dolphins. So the little video that's playing right now is actually a bone that's about the size of the end of your thumb. And it, it's a bone that's referred to as the periodic. It actually is the inner ear complex of one of these dolphins. And uh, this little movie is made up of hundreds of individual CT scans of x-rays that were compiled in a program that shows the inner structure, the morphology of the inner structure of the ear bones of one of these dolphins. And so you can see the stapes, the little bone that fills in that space. Let's see if I can get my, so I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'm pointing at the stapes, the bone that actuates and moves the fluid in this snail-like uh, snail -like structure here, which allows the dolphin to discriminate different frequencies of sound. So this bone is very, very important to, modern to fossil and modern dolphins because it allows them to echolocate and to see sound as it is reflected back to them. They interpret the reflected sound just like um, bats do. They, they, it's a biosonar that they have. And so they use uh, sounds that are made on their face, just behind, just above the eyes, clicks and whistles. And those sounds are sent out, are propagated through the ocean water and they bounce off of objects, fish, or other objects in the water and come back to them. And so dolphins are seeing with sound. And they had a very sophisticated, even Miocene dolphins had a very sophisticated biosonar. And so they were very well adapted at hunting, even in pitch black by using just clicks and whistles like modern dolphins do. And so finally, uh, we have the baleen whales, the largest whales that were here. And they were generally much smaller than most living whales. They would have been about the size, the largest Miocene whale that we found find here would have been about the size of a minke whale, which is the smallest of the baleen whales that lives today. And this is an example of a beautiful skull that we quarried some years ago. Here we are trying to pull the jacketed skull away from the base of the cliff, very much like, uh, I don't know, primitive Egyptians using levers, uh, simple, to, simple uh, leverage here to pull that uh, skull 
which weighed a thousand pounds out away from the base of the cliff. Fortunately, we didn't have to carry this skull uh, down the beach to get it back to the museum. We were able to uh, conscript the search and rescue team from Naval Air Station Patuxent River. They have a search and rescue team because they have test pilots that fly out of that air base. And uh, if there's ever a pilot that goes down, they can send out this team to rescue them. And so the, the person that you can see dangling from the helicopter is called the swimmer. And they came down with the, rappelled down with a cable that attached down here. You can see the white jacket uh, on the beach. I'm out in the water videotaping this and this huge Sea King helicopter picked up this thousand pound jacket and moved it to a place where we could just more easily load it into our pickup truck. So I've worked at the Calvert Marine Museum for 23 years now. I've been exceedingly blessed. And uh, the museum is uh, supported by the citizens of Calvert County, Maryland. 60% of our funding comes from taxpayer dollars and the balance we raise ourselves. And so I'm very grateful to, uh, to Calvert County citizens and the Calvert County commissioners for funding the museum. We have beautiful exhibits. Uh, you should come and see them because uh, it would be wor well worth the trip. And the art that you saw was done by one of our former, our former um, exhibits department members, Tim Shire. And I'm very fortunate because I also have an endowment that allows me to do all sorts of things that I would not be able to do otherwise. So that concludes my presentation. And if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer those now. I guess what I'll do is I'll stop sharing. And so if there are any questions, uh, feel free to to ask those now. In that one uh, slide, you showed it was like a gold uh, like this. Kathleen, if that's you, I can't hear you, sweetie. Oh, uh, yeah. It, it's like a coop. You know, it's like a gold. What was that gold thing? It, was, it went like this. It went like a gel. I apologize. I can't make out what you're trying to say. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry, Kathleen, you are really cutting out bad and we can't hear you. So I think you might just need to take a break tonight. Stephen, how often I have a question. Do you, how often do you even <laughs> find a, a skull sticking out of a cliff someplace? So as the cliffs erode naturally, there's quite a large number of uh, amateur collectors who are keeping an eye on the cliffs. And uh, the cliffs are all privately owned, either by private citizens or private property owners or by the state or the county. And so we've gotten to know a lot of the private property owners along Calvert Cliffs. And for us, it's only a phone call if uh, a, a skull is reported to us eroding from the cliffs. So as the cliffs erode back, you can imagine that uh, this hand here are the fossils and this vertical hand here is the cliff face. And so as the cliff erodes back, the fossils that are in the cliff become exposed. And if they're just shells, they tumble down onto the beach. But if it's a dolphin skull or a whale skull, it can actually protrude a little ways uh, uh, out of the cliff face. And so if someone spies it and reports it to us, and as I mentioned, there's a large pool of people who know that obviously we're interested in fossils and, and preserving them in perpetuity here for the public good, then they'll let us know and we'll go out and excavate the, the fossil for the Marine Museum. In, in our exhibits, we also have a fish, like a fish bowl where, where uh, volunteers are preparing the fossils that we excavate along the cliffs. And so I would say that tip, in a typical year, we probably excavate about five dolphin skulls and maybe one whale skull. Hmm. Okay. I have a question, unless my, my connection is breaking up. Has You're everyone good. got it? You're good. Uh, it's about this. I found this at Calvert Cliffs at the park that you know everyone walks up to. Uh, if I can share my screen, I can show you better pictures instead of just holding it up to my camera. I'm good with that. Um, cool. Hold on one second. Uh, here we go. You all seeing that? No. Oh, yes. Okay. I can see it now. Yes. Cool. Uh, that's, that's just looking down through it. Uh, here's from the other side. Um, 
I've been explained to that this might not be a bone. It might be something that formed around something on a ship and fell off, like a concretion or I don't know. But it came from off, you know, in the water, off the beach of Calvert Cliffs, you know, the normal, typical beach that everyone walks two miles to get to. Uh, okay. About five yeah. years ago. <laughs> yes. So thank you for sharing this. I'm quite confident that it is not bone, but it is not something that fell off a ship. It's actually a concretion of sediment. So in cross section, you could see that it was not spongy like a bone. It didn't have the right structure for it to be a bone. But what it probably is, is what's referred to as a rhizolith. Rhizo as in a rhizome, like a root. And lith just means like lithology, like stone. So imagine a root growing and, and, and sediment around that root cements naturally. There's a change in the pH and the sediment cemented around that root and then the root rotted away. And so that's why you have that hollow hole in the middle. So you've got a, an, an iron carbonate, an iron mineral type sediment because it's a sort of rusty color. So you've got a lot of iron oxide, but it's an iron mi uh, mineral that formed probably around a root from a plant. Wow. It's not magnetic at all. I did test that. No, uh, no. Yeah, so it it's, it's not a magnetic yeah. form of it iron. Definitely looks iron. Okay, thank you. <laughs> sure, thank you for sharing. Any other questions? Nice reindeer in the back. Nice deer in the back. Great program. We've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much, my pleasure. So I also have a few other talks on fossils from Calvert Cliffs, one on Megalodon, one on whales, uh, one on the fish, one on sea cows. So in the future, if you're looking for somebody to present, I'd be happy to talk to you guys again. I thoroughly enjoyed talking to you and I'm delighted that so many of you are interested in, uh, in geology and, and of course the fossils from Calvert Cliffs. Thank you very much. Thank you, really. If we wanted to come down as a, an amateur, how is it the best place to go? <laughs> yes, yeah, so that's a very good question. and. Uh, it's a perennial problem here in Calvert County. The vast majority of the cliffs are privately owned. So there are some public access points along the cliffs. Starting at the north end, there's a place called Bayfront Park. Bayfront Park, it's also known as Brownies Beach. Um, but I would not recommend that you come between Memorial Day and, uh, and Labor Day. The summer months, they charge like a crazy amount of money. I think it's like $18 per person to park and walk to the beach. So wait till after Labor Day, then access is free. There's a parking lot which is only about a tenth of a mile from the beach and you can walk down to the beach and that's a great place to start if you're looking for shark teeth because the shark teeth will be on the beach right where the waves are breaking. There'll be a coarser like sandy gravel and that's what you want to look through. You want to scoop that up and just throw it onto the beach and let the waves wash it. And as the waves are washing it, you'll be able to pull out the tiny shark teeth uh, that occur there. And uh, that's what Melody was talking about when she couldn't help herself when she went onto the beach. Uh, people get hooked on <laughs> finding fossil shark teeth, but that's a great <laughs> place to start. Then there's another beach called Breezy Point Beach, which is a public access beach, which you can get onto. There you won't really see the cliffs very much. But again, if you dig through the sand and, and coarse uh, shelly-like material that's been ground up on the beach, you'll find shark teeth there. There's another place called Flag Ponds, which uh, you will see the cliffs on either side, but they're not right behind you. That's a huge, huge beach where uh, people do find also uh, fossil shark teeth there, but you have to look really hard. And then there, of course, there's the Calvert Cliffs State Park, so Calvert Cliffs refers to the 35 miles of, of cliff, but there's a state park which is much smaller and it's towards the southern end of the cliffs. And it's a two mile walk. So if you go to Calvert Cliffs State Park, be ready for a two mile walk to the beach and back again. But once you get to the beach, they have signs up that basically prevent you from walking below the cliffs. They're concerned about liability and the cliffs collapsing. So I understand that, but it's frustrating to people who want to walk below the cliffs and collect fossils. 
So just remember that you can collect any fossil that's on the beach. You just can't dig into the cliffs because in Maryland, mm -hmm. private property extends down to the mean high tide. And so the cliffs then are all privately owned. If you have permission from the property owner, you can, of course, quarry into the cliffs. And that's what we have to do. Just because I'm the curator of paleontology here at the Marine Museum doesn't give me permission to just go and start digging wherever I want. We have to have permission uh, before we excavate along the cliffs. Thank you for all that information. If I find anything, I'll call you. Sure. To get, and get it. Sure. <laughs> Hey, Dr. Goffrey, did you hear about the, the shark that got to be famous? He, he turned into a starfish. <laughs> I'm, I'm thrilled that you've prepared some jokes for this evening. <laughs> it's, light and, it's light and otherwise serious talk. <laughs> I've worked best on the theme, yeah. But uh, that was a great program. Uh, it really was. And we had a... We had a total of 44 people in the, in the room tonight, which is a little bit higher than usual. So, obviously, the top. Jerry, uh, and Jerry's jokes are legendary. Okay, thank you. Yeah, once you hear it, you don't want to hear it again. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we have fun time doing this, and we we appreciate appreciate your time. And uh, uh, I think I'll be back in touch with you uh, down the road here a little bit. Uh, okay, just quickly, there was one question in the chat. It said, what, what's the age of the fossil shark teeth from Florida? So basically in Florida, you can find shark teeth over the past 50, five zero, 50 million years. They're not all from a narrow, like so along here, along Calvary Cliffs, they're constrained to about 10 million years. But in Florida, depending on where you are on the state and where you're collecting fossil shark teeth, they can range in age from about 50 million years ago to uh, shark teeth that are much younger. Okay. Thank you all. And next, uh, this coming weekend, I'll probably be on the beaches of uh, all these islands looking for shark, shark teeth, South Carolina there. So I just look at the, at the chat. A lot of thank you to, uh, to you, doctor, for your wonderful program, according to the chat. So, uh, um, want everybody to have a, a, a good week off next week when we're not back together for another two weeks. And uh, be safe out there, whatever you do. Uh, the Cavill Cliffs area is a great place. It's about two and a half hours uh, from uh, York down there. I just checked that on the map to make sure that I knew what I found out. So, uh, it's a good. Uh, Good one day field trip. And uh, I'll pass over to Brittany. You can close it off there, Brittany. All righty. Thanks, Jerry. And thank you so much. That was wonderful. And I apologize for that. Anyways, thank you everyone. And I'm not going to be back till the 27th. So everybody stay safe and have a good couple weeks. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Who was it that we met, Brittany? Who was it? Who was, who was that that we met, Brittany? Now you're your children, right, Brittany?